I became the first person to start in a prison cell to participate in the Olympics. If you saw us, you would not think, oh yeah, these are criminals. These are dudes that are gonna go to prison. This one's gonna die. We go in, we're standing in the garage. I turned to my co-defendant and he was like shaking. And I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, I'm nervous, bro. Yeah. And I'm like, don't say nothing. Count to three, follow my lead. So he counts to three. One, two, three. I came from a pretty ideal family. Upper right. middle class, um, but my parents, you know, started in a trailer. Dad dropped out of high school. Uh, he dropped out of high school because grandpa said if he didn't have $5,000 in the bank, he couldn't marry mom. So my dad loved my mom and said, I'm getting out of school and I'm going to get to work and I'm going to get the $5,000. He got into trucking and that was how he started. And uh, he got the $5,000 and said, I'm going to marry your daughter. And he married my mom. They uh, started in a trailer together, saving money, working. And they both got into the trucking industry, moved to Orange County for work where I was born originally, and then moved to a place called Fresno County, which is the ag capital of the world. 30% of the world's produce is grown from the area that, I'm, that I was raised in. They moved there for work, trucking. A right. trucking company opened up there. And, uh, you know, we never, I, I, I did not know what it was to want for something. Right. Um, I wouldn't quite say that I was spoiled to the, to the degree that I was showing up to uh, school in a $70,000 car, but I always had food. Right. We always had a roof over our head. The lights were always on. Mom and dad have been married 47 years now. So in terms of how good was my childhood, it was pretty ideal. But, you know, like any other family, my, my family had our struggles. You know, mom and dad were workaholics. So that was, you know, out the door 5, 6 a.m. in the morning, coming home 9, 10 o'clock at night, raised by Vera, who was my brother and I's babysitter. And I think that was really where it started a lot of my internal struggles um, early on. You know, sometimes people change and their struggles come later in life. Mine started to show up in my early teens when I was struggling with myself. And a lot of that really kind of stemmed from not really having my dad around as much as I wanted him around. And then just being a person that was had a lot of emotions that I didn't quite understand and was like fighting within myself. And then I hated my sports gift. I was a really good athlete, but I hated that I was good at sports because I didn't like being better than other people. But it was like the only time I ever felt any kind of relief from myself was while I was playing sports. Um, but that was also the uh, time when I got kicked out of school for selling weed. Um, girl came around and said she was looking for some weed. And I was like, shit, this guy in my guitar class is always talking about being high and showing up high and s smoking weed all the time. And so I hit him up and the dude was like, yeah, meet me, meet me tomorrow morning and I'll get you the weed. How, yeah. how old were you? 12. Okay. 13, 12, 13 years old, seventh grade. Right. And uh, that whole experience, I, I wrote it in my book, was a little bit weird because like looking back on it now, that wasn't weed. But I grew up in a very conservative um pocket of california right right and so i went to clovis unified school district was a very strong zero tolerance policy so really what i was already presenting to them even if it wasn't weed was that i wasn't going to get onto their assembly line and perform the way a clovis student performed i mean we're talking about a school district that didn't allow guys to have hair past their ears and you couldn't wear sports teams. You couldn't wear college sports teams gear. We didn't have uniforms, but you also couldn't have jeans that were four inches wider than your knee when you pulled them out. So it was like, here's this kid who's come into our office uh, because a girl said that I'm the one that sold her this weed. Well, I sat in this guy, um, his LD Bennett, uh, Todd Bennett was his name. And the principal? Um, he was like the, the learning counselor. Okay. So he's, he's works with certain wings of students out of this middle school. That's got 1200 students. Right. And, uh, I still, to this day, don't like this guy. What? There was just something, <laughs> there was just something, of, dude, there's good people and there's bad people straight right. up. Right. Like I've met good people in prison and I've met really fucking bad people that have never been to prison. And this guy just had that aura to him. And even I picked up on it when I was a kid. That's just something ain't right with this guy, right? He interrogates me for like three hours. Doesn't let me call my mom. Doesn't let me talk to anybody. And I'm like, yo, I didn't do this. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. There's some guy behind the apartments that's probably selling it. And, you know, then they send the cops out and they couldn't find the guy. And then they come back in and they're like, you're lying. I'm 12 or 13 years old. Right. Bro. Like looking back on it, this is illegal. Yeah. Like my mom should have been called. My mom should have been there. They should have said, hey, do you want an attorney present? Like, how do you want to do this? And then we would have said, show us the. Weed. 
And then the widowed male will say, this is leaves. Right. Dried leaves. You're not kicking my son out for selling weed. That's not even weed, right? Um, but so, yeah, I ended up confessing that, yeah, I did it. After three hours, it was just kind of exhaustion. As a kid, you just want to get it over with. Yeah. But that was kind of like the beginning of, okay, I might have these struggles that are going to pop up later in life. I ended up getting on the straight and narrow right after that because I – my brother raced BMX, and my dad was like, you know, go out to the BMX track with your brother. My parents kind of gave me maybe too much freedom before this, and then they were going to kind of rein in some of that freedom with me being with my brother. And so I got into racing at 12, 13 years old, and I uh, was on the cover of the BMX Racing Magazine uh, at 18, was sponsored by Fox Racing, Airwalk Shoes, Spy Sunglasses, companies that uh, didn't endorse amateur athletes were uh, backing me. Um, because of my skill set and my ability to ride a bicycle. But um, that only lasted so long because I didn't even really want to ride a bike. You know, I really wanted to make money. Right. And that's kind of what I thought. You don't uh, you don't make any money riding BMX? 10 to $15,000 a year. Really? Yes. But what are the sponsors doing? I mean, what that's are they? That's it. There's no money in the sport. It's like track and field. Right. Most people think that track and field's you know, runners, because we see them at the Olympics, oh, they got to be making millions of dollars. Right. Sure, if you're Lolo Jones, Allison Felix, or Usain Bolt, but everybody else makes about $10,000 a year, and they have parents that fund their trips around the world. Right. And that's how they actually got to a position where they could get funded by their country, the United States uh, Olympic team, and then it can open up an opportunity. Well, BMX is no different. At the, the average guy makes ten to $15,000 a year. And their parents are funding it. There's a small pocket of guys that can make sixty grand a year, maybe three. Right. And one girl that can do that. So the average person is just out there as a hobby. Right. And uh, you know the the whole consumerism dream was kind of like coming alive in the early two thousands. You got the dot com boom, access to the internet starting to roll around, and then this idea of you know just I can obtain all of these sparkly things and have a big home and a nice car is like what the American dream was rapidly becoming and that's what i wanted and so i took this computer gift that i was developing uh to build corporate computer networks i wanted to be a network administrator and manage uh corporate networks the idea the reason i liked that idea was mainly because i could lock myself in a closet i didn't really like talking to people i had social anxiety really bad for mo uh, for most of my life still do in, in a lot of different ways and right. not, this one not being one of them um, but, uh, I was, you know, learning how to build Citrix Metaframes, Cisco certified my high school year. And then I got offered a job in San Diego to be a network administrator for a guy that was starting a company that ended up being a Ponzi scheme, <laughs> scam artist, this, which is perfect for the show, yeah. right? Like it's just say, one twist after the other. And we just did an interview where our talk to a, an FBI agent that you just missed. Mm -hmm. And we, we went over like three or four different Ponzi schemes he had investigated yeah so i and i had no idea because my 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 aunt knew this guy's wife right he was entrepreneur of the year of california at 23 he's he quote unquote invented this vpn box and then was monitoring uh, all of these corporations around San Diego County with this VPN box had a big server room up in his office. Like, you, well, you wouldn't know it, right? Well, he was then taking the stature of that entrepreneur award in this VPN box, and then he was canvassing these other people for investments towards this internet company that he was going to start. Right. And here's this young hotshot network administrator that I'm getting who understands uh, backbone infrastructure, managing networks, setting up networks, and is going to do all of this stuff for me. And I remember sitting down at a table with these people. One of them owned a telco company. And uh, that was the only meeting we had. <laughs> so when I moved down to San Diego, like the job wasn't working out. But before I moved down there is when I quit racing. And that's when I like started dabbling in smoking and partying with people um, and I guess trying to find my footing is what I tell people because I, I under I love the psychology of why people do what they do right and I've done a lot of work on myself um, but I struggled a lot with my mental health and so when I gave up on racing I lost kind of my community of really like healthy support and then I started going around kids that were partying and stuff and I was the odd man out because that's what I told people I'm not gonna do this and right. I, st I started giving in but we didn't really do shit for me just made me super paranoid, made me feel like I was outside of myself. Um, but before I went to San Diego, I tried to knock on for the first time. And that was something that I can't explain. It just changed me. 
You just tried it like at a party? It wasn't? Yeah. So when we had bought in Vicodin. Right. And the yellow Vicodin was like the top tier. And then this new drug comes out. My buddy says, yo, this guy that we buy this dope from, he's got these new pills. He's out of Vicodin. He's got these new ones. He said they're called the 80s. And he's like, he said, we, me and you can just split it. That's how good it is. And he's like, you want to you split it with me? And I'm like, yeah, fuck it. Let's do it. And uh, we, we literally go into this small um, powder bath, right, attached to his entryway of the garage. Right. And you, you, you get a sink and a toilet. And we've got this green 80 milligram Oxycontin. At this time, we don't know how to effectively take off the time release because that's what you do. You don't just pop this thing. Yeah. You got to take the time release off. Then you got to smash it. And then you snort it. Or if you get later down the road where I was at, you start shooting them. Um, we got a knife to smash this fucking pill. Right. Like a, the tip of a knife on this round pill. And he puts this pill on top of the toilet shooting all over the shot the fucking thing all over dude right like oh like we're trying to figure this out like like trying to rebuild a transmission with no knowledge like you're just wrong tools don't know what you're doing finally we get it figured out we get it figured out and that was when my life changed like bro i have never felt so connected to myself so sure of myself so confident um and i felt valuable I felt uh, capable. It was like, you know, I had a guy on my podcast years ago that said it was like the warmest hug from God that I've ever felt. I've heard that exact exclamation before. It's so good. It it is really so good because if you believe in God or if if you could imagine what a God would be, that touch or that presence would be so overwhelmingly good, you would be in a place of absolute contentness and that's what it was for the first time in my life you know i struggled feeling okay with myself i struggled with anxiety i struggled with self-hatred and these things and it was like all of a sudden i could split this pill and it could change and alter the way that i felt to the way i always wanted to feel which was always the way i thought everybody else got to feel i was the odd man out that never got to feel right i was going to have to take this drug to try and fix me well, that day, obviously, my life changed in understanding that I liked Oxycontin. Did it a few times when I moved down to San Diego. The job didn't work out. But while I was down in San Diego, I was smoking a lot of weed. Like, did that was, the job not work out because the FBI showed up? No, or? because he was, he was just running the scam of getting these people to give him the money, right? So we show up. We have a big meeting one time, and he says, this is Tony. He's going to be my network administrator. This is going to be the phone number. This is going to be the website. And so these there, guys are investors. Oh, so there really is no job. Is that it? Or? Well, so he has and this is crazy because he worked for a company called all basis covered okay which at the time tim motts was the ceo and if you know anything about tim motts he helped start apple computers with steve jobs okay. he also was the ceo of ea sports it's in the game and he, he told me this i met him on an elevator cool little old short guy right. and uh, he says he was the ceo of ea sports I, it was crazy i had a little interaction with him but when i moved there looking back all the stuff was set up that this wasn't going to go the way we thought so we go to dinner we go to this sushi restaurant and he's like so the company's not quite ready yet i'm going to interview you tonight to see if you can be a consultant for all basis covered which is basically all basis covered outsourced it work to corporations so instead of having an in-house it guy they call all basis covered they send out tony he works on your network works on your computers he asks me all these questions and he's like, all right, um, yeah, you'll be fine. And so he puts me on the payroll at all basis covered, making $20 an hour in 2002, which was actually a really good pay for 2002, right. you know? But the problem was I don't look 40 right now. Right. At 18, bro, I looked like I was 12. Right. I went into this law firm and a lady came up right on my back as I'm working grabs you on the shoulder and she said, sweetheart, can you stop working on the computers? She called all bases covered and said, we don't want him working on the computers. He looks way too young. There's no way this kid knows what somebody that's older would know about working on computers. So then I wasn't getting hours. And I'm down in San Diego by myself, young 18 year old. I got no friends, but I've got a second cousin who lives at the bottom of this hill. My aunt was pretty wealthy. She lived on top of this hill. 
in uh, Rancho, uh, Rancho San Diego, and he lives in a trailer, and he smokes. So I go down there and start smoking with Zach, and uh, next thing you know, these Chaldean dudes roll in, and I'm like, what the fuck are they doing? He pulls out this big old duffel bag, fucking boom, full of, and it's this shit called P91. And it's specifically run by these Chaldean, which are uh, Catholic Iraqis that uh, migrated to a pocket of San Diego. P91. They run it. They own it exclusively. And it is still to this day some of the best I've ever smoked in my life. And uh, these other guys meet up there and they're thousands of dollars of cash, ounces of weed. And you're just there to smoke some I'm, weed. With I'm just there just to smoke out. some Right. right. With your and cousin. And so and I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm down at the beach. Right. There's a lot of money going I'm, I'm, back and I, forth. I here. hang out with these college girls that I went to school with. They're going to USD. USD is a lot of money. There's all the parents are paying for all these kids' apartments. Front me a quarter. Right. I'll take it down and see if I can sell it. Um, and at this time, you know, it wasn't really a party drug. So the college kids just wanted to drink. That was one thing that's changed in the years is kids smoking is you know just as acceptable as drinking alcohol but at this time it was still a very like yo you're doing if you're right. smoking weed right so it was still difficult for me to sell um more than i was actually smoking for myself and with the girls that i, I grew up with and at their apartment on the beach but that was what opened up the door for the wheel of me selling to people supplying something that somebody needed was something that i felt um, was of high quality. Um, I'm a very detailed oriented person. And like looking back, like the, me getting into the way I got into selling it, um, makes perfect sense. I'm just a detail oriented person. I, I pick up on the small details. And so it was like, I don't, I don't want Columbia from, or, uh, I don't want, uh, from Canada and I don't want from Mexico. I want weed that was grown in a hydro tank or f grown up North. And you can tell the difference between those two types of weed. And I want to sell people the highest quality and they're going to come to me for the highest quality weed. So this started this whole, I could sell this stuff. Right. Then the job doesn't work out. Like I'm not getting any hours anymore with all bases covered. And I ended up telling the guy, I was like, yo, I'm, I'm going to go home. Like clearly something's not, happening and i think i'm just gonna go home i didn't find out that he was wanted by the fbi until i was in prison several years later my dad actually sent me a, a article from yahoo they believed he was hiding in spain um and took off with his money and had um basically stolen millions of dollars um from people including his in-laws he got wow. his in-laws for a million and uh yeah but how, you know i'm a kid i don't know Right. I remember this guy working on a computer one time at his house and literally smashing it with his hand and thinking, it's not you're a computer guy? It. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what you do? Something ain't right. You know? But he lived in a million dollar house and drove a, a Mercedes, an S500 Brabus Benz. You, you that's think. Easy. That's easy to do when it's Ponzi scheme money. Yeah. But you think when you're young that people work hard. Yeah. And he achieved that. Yeah. And then you become an adult and you start seeing people with Lamborghinis and you see people with these stuff and you wonder, I wonder how they got that. Yeah. Because <laughs> that lifestyle takes a lot of money. Right. And when they're running and gunning like that all the time, so usually something's up, right? So I go back home and I start looking for a dealer. I'm going to start selling to my friends. Getting a job was not something I wanted to do. I couldn't sit down at a desk, bro. And I right. still can't. I can't work for anybody else. And I can't let somebody else define what I'm worth. I'll create my worth through the work that I do and the value that I bring to help the people that I help with what I help them with. And so I find a dude to start selling me with. And at this time, I'm making money and I'm starting to buy these cottons. Not thinking much about it other than it's this pharmaceutical pill that makes me feel great. I'm going to buy them as much as I can and I'm going to sell as much as I can. You know, started working up my uh, up the ladder to where I was, you know, picking up three, four ounces at a time, five ounces at a time. I was never a big uh, 20 pound dealer. I wasn't putting shit in a mailbox and sending it to Atlanta where they didn't have good back then. Right. I was selling to my friends and I start getting hooked on these pills more and more. Start and building up a tolerance and yeah. not really realizing what's happening. Yeah, well, now I'm taking three a day. Yeah, that's not good. And and it's not 
one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. It's usually one at two, one at seven, one at ten. Right. I'm, you know, really cutting down the time that I'm taking them. Well, I try for the first time, and I try, and it. I didn't like it, but I couldn't stop doing it, which was weird. Uh, but that's how works if you've ever done it you, you go up you come down really quick so you go, want to go back up really quick so you're not feeling down and i end up thinking to myself well maybe i could sell this shit and this is when things start to really get out of control for me in terms of like selling and bringing in cash i was originally buying um small amounts teens and eight balls from this guy in, a, in my neighborhood and I was like at one point going back like five or six times in a night, picking up teens and eight balls to sell, turn around, make some cash. And then I was going to save that cash, buy more and then buy more pills. Right. Well, finally, one time I leave this guy's apartment and there's this dude on a street bike just down the parking lot. And he's like, come here. And I walk over to him and uh, he says, here's my number. Don't fuck with this guy anymore. He started to realize this guy ain't the one buying the f right is this dude the motorcycle guy the motorcycle guy he's like call me for it well next thing you know he's like i'll, I'll front you whatever you want you know now i'm picking up six seven eight ounces of driving around fucking this really super conservative part of california called clovis where you know you get pulled over for being a mexican a black person an asian person or a white dude out past 10 30 at night just to see what the, what you're up to right and, uh, you know, I'm making two, three thousand dollars in a night sometimes, two, two, three days a week. Well, now my pill problem goes through the roof because now I can use four, five, and six pills. Mm -hmm. But what we were doing at that time was mainly getting them from a kid we went to school with. His mom had multiple sclerosis. And at this time, like you've, most everybody that's listening to this probably have seen, has seen one of the documentaries or shows that kind of outline how the opioid epidemic started, right? right. It was uh, doctors became willing to prescribe these things so freely um, that the demand went through the roof when the addiction started. And then it was just like, well, prescribe them more because the withdrawal symptoms are just breakthrough pain. And you stop that by taking more. Well, yeah, shit. If I don't want to withdraw from I just shoot more right if you don't want to withdraw from cotton which is pharmaceutical take more cotton so the night that i tried the cotton with my friend in the bathroom mm -hmm. we walked out of there and we were when we got high we were so pumped and our friend says my mom's got thousands of these things at home and we were like bullshit motherfucker showed up with a freezer bag filled is she the not top. taking them or she's just getting the the script filled every single I, month and just taking what she needs and has right. the leftover so it's just gaining correct it's got to be yeah that's the only explanation freezer bag filled these are the 40 milligrams so they're like a yellow mustardy color right and he says just give me five dollars for each one they're twenty dollars for a 40 milligram right so all of us many of them which are dead now start buying these pills because who doesn't have five dollars on them right well over a short period of time it goes from who doesn't have five dollars on them to like yo yoshi's hawking his xbox right now right or he's stealing shit from his parents to buy these pills and uh she, she caught him she finally figured it out well the brother got into it too and then all of his friends so it was like you've got two siblings going to the same medicine cabinet, draining the only supply that exists for the, for us at this right. time. And when she caught them, that was when we were we were introduced to the highest level of withdrawals because now we can't get them. Right. And I like I told you earlier, to me, how I explain that is the worst flu times 100. Right. I had the Delta variant of COVID, and it put me in bed for, I don't know, 13 days. Like, I was sick, sick. I would rather have COVID every four months than ever have to experience an opioid withdrawal ever again. Like, I'm totally cool with being in bed 13 days and an excruciating pain from that versus what opioids do to you. Because the opioids... The, the part that really messes you up is knowing that you can stop the pain that you're in. 
just get the drug. Mm-hmm. And because of that, you become willing to do things that you would you you promised yourself you would never do. You never saw yourself doing. Um, you become willing to do things to stop this pain that you're in because you know once you get the drug, it instantly stops and the pain is gone. So we can't get the pills anymore. So we're trying to find new dealers. Well, we find new dealers, but if you've watched the opioid segments and, and stuff, there was a period when Purdue Pharma wasn't producing enough for the demand. They were overprescribing, then the demand was far, uh, far more than the supply was. And this is when uh, regular folk were showing up at the pharmacies, pounding on the desks and yelling at the pharmacist, where's my fucking prescriptions? Um, one of my best friend's dads was one of those people. Right. Um, he was being prescribed it and he's going to the pharmacy banging on the thing like where's my fucking pills well we don't got any like we're waiting for them to show up Um, so we would kept going through these routes and it had been several months had gone by and we were withdrawn i was living with some kids that i went to high school with my parents kicked me out of the house they found me a quarter pound in my backpack when i came home from san diego and uh, my mom's gonna flush it down the toilet and my dad's like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, you don't know whose that is. Right. Don't, don't you dare. Put that in his car and he can get out of here. And my dad was like, we don't do this. This right. isn't how we run our house. Get the fuck out. But I don't want to get you killed either. But I don't want to get you yeah. killed either, right? My dad, um, he was a professional motocross racer and he's even got a story. His best friend, Wardy Ring, uh, which was his mechanic, uh, they went to Mexico And uh, they were going to do a big, Wardy was going to do his one big last drug deal for like 70, the last big, for 75, I think my dad said it was $75,000 that he had hidden inside an, uh, a motor of a motorcycle. And uh, uh, they found Wardy dead. And my, my dad goes back to the motorcycle to see if the cash is there and it's gone. Mm. So I know my dad knows. He's never really disclosed like what it was like when he was younger. Yeah. And he's kept that tight lip, yeah. probably because he doesn't want me to follow his but path. But he's, he, but he's done some stuff. He's done some yeah. stuff. Enough to know, don't you dare flush that down the toilet. Like If he owes money for that, they're going to come looking for him. So they kicked me out of the house, and I was living with these kids. And if you saw us, you would not think, oh, yeah, these are criminals. These are dudes that are going to go to prison. This one's going to die. This one's going to be 40 years old, in and out, living on the street. Uh, this guy is also going to go to prison. Like, you wouldn't think that because up to this point in you know the early 2000s, any education that we got on addiction was a person that had darker colored skin right. or no teeth. Yeah. This is what addiction looks like. Yeah. They didn't show you the alcoholic doctor. Right. And surgeon. They didn't show you the pharmacist who was struggling with a fentermine addiction because they had body dysmorphia and needed to lose weight. So they were stealing the fentermine pills from the pharmacy. Right. They didn't show you that highly educated people or light skinned people or just regular people could become addicted to anything. And that addiction could take you on this whirlwind. Right. So these kids that I'm talking about are, are kids that at that time you would look at and be like, what? These are these are good kids. The reality was we were up to shit. Um, I was going to say, I was going to mention that, remember that the book I told you I wrote, Generation mm-hmm. Like all four of the kids were white kids, blonde hair, blue eyed. Um, some were lower middle class, but most of them were upper middle class. There was like five of them. All of them were on the their high school wrestling team. Mm-hmm. Four of them went away got scholarships and went away. Like you would never look at the, and that's really why I wrote that story because I was like, it was so unique because I'd heard the same types of stories, but you're right. It was always black kids, Hispanic kids. It was always, it, it, it was it was never like these clean cut, all American white kids that they're so desperate for the pills. They're, they're doctor shopping. They're picking up homeless people. They're paying for their MRIs. They're sending yeah. them here. They're, and this was before they had, uh, the um, the the statewide registry. When that oh, happened, yeah. then they just went out and started to get just multiple people. It was the same thing, like you were talking about. The first time guys they were buying them from were people that were legitimately had like back problems, but were getting the maximum pills. But they were like, I don't take them all. 
Like I, I, they don't, they know there's a, it's an issue. So they're like, I only need this many. So I have this left over. And these kids are giving them $500 for the pills and they're selling them for 15 or $1,800. So who doesn't want an extra $500? Right. Or for us, you know, at the time when we get develop into the story, the cheapest pill that you could get from the pharmacy was about $9 and 50 cents at Walmart on Kings Canyon. Everybody else, every other pharmacy was between 10 and $12 a pill. That's per pill. That's straight wholesale. The person goes, they want at least the cost of that prescription plus a thousand dollars. Right. So by the time you're getting a good deal on these pills, it's about 18 to $20. If you can get an 80 milligram, for 18 to 20 dollars you're scoring super cheap because you're going to turn around and make 100 percent, or you're going to take the route where you're going to sell more and make up the money on selling more at 30 dollars than you would selling fewer and slower at 40 dollars right right but now the interesting thing you said was these people didn't take all of them when i first met my first big connection which um kind of spiraled into this whole thing of being a wild shit show of organized crime basically right. um he I, i'll never forget he'd be like you fucking white boys are crazy he's like i take a small sliver of this thing and i'm fine you guys are eating these things like they're baby aspirin right he knew like just what that pill was and he would go over just cutting into a small piece of it of an 80 milligram and he was getting 380 of a month like the guy didn't, he knew that he didn't need all of that for his his struggle. And so somebody that actually needs it, they're getting way more dope than they need to keep their pain uh, at bay, you know? Right. And so. Well, and some people, you know, they just don't, if you're smart, you realize you're going to have to live with some pain. It's the people like, I don't want any pain. Well, now you become, you very quickly become a drug addict. Like yeah. if you've got a back problem that, well, here, I'm going to give you these pills and it's going to go away. Like the, the smart choice or a smart conversation to have with the, with your patient is it's not going to go away. You're going to have to live with some pain because yep. they'll keep up in the dose until they have no pain. And next thing you know, is a full blown drug addict. Yeah. You know, yep. you can't function. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, but back in the day, how are you going to know? Yeah. Well, and, per, and per, like you said, Purdue Pharma, right? They're telling you take what well, the, the, the solution is for it not lasting the full 12 hours is take more, more. like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and you know what? Uh your dad, my dad, um the boomers, they all believed that doctors oh, were absolutely. the smartest people in the world. Absolutely. They understood every aspect of these medications they were prescribing and why would they give us something that would cost us our life, our freedom or our ability to logically make decisions anymore. At and at that time there were no documentaries explaining that they're pushing it that it's they're fighting over getting getting the client getting that doctor as a client to push it and they're paying the doctor to push it and he's getting a piece to yes. push it and they're giving him speaking engagements that he barely shows up for if at all yeah that they're 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 sending him on junkets on these great vacations like there's all these things that they're doing to like you you know that's to, to pad their to pad their pockets to get him to push more and more, more and more, more. yeah it, 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 it really uh has been good to see so many documentaries bringing awareness to you know something i saw happening in the early 2000s um but i didn't understand how it was happening the only thing i knew was there's this thing that came out of the orange bottle which my perception of the orange bottle was that it was safe right. as long as i don't do PCP, LSD, the things the dare program told me to stay away from then i could never be the person without the teeth yeah you know and uh so we couldn't get the pills and uh, one day um i woke up and i and i just said you know we should we should go rob dude's mom <laughs> that was a leap i mean that's that's a hell of a jump it's me two of my co-defendants my girlfriend and one of my co-defendants girlfriends were there and they're like oh yeah we should do that <laughs> there was nobody <laughs> nobody was the the voice of reason to go well, we're all coming down <laughs> Maybe we talked to our parents to try and get into a drug rehab. Or... <laughs> no, no, there wasn't none of that. No. <laughs> and at first it was kind of tongue in cheeky. Right. Like it's, we could go get them. We should do that. And then next thing you know, like we're, we're how would we do it? Oh, it's getting bad. You know, and uh, 
we, the biggest hurdle was how are we going to get the brothers out of the house? And because they know you. Yeah. You're still, you're trying to do it, not. Yeah. We don't do want them to know. Okay. Yeah. We, we, I mean. Right. So this, and this is where it gets, it gets fucked because you're, you're scheming on, well, how would we do this? Right. You know, and, and there's a threshold. Once you cross that threshold of this is possible. Right. You're planning you're, it. You're going to do yeah. it. And, yeah. uh, and that was what it was. Yeah. This isn't a hypothetical. This is a plan. No, this is a plan yeah. now. And, uh, one of my co-defendants that um, died at 28, he uh, he called the brothers over. He's like, hey, yeah, come by. Let's hang out. When they leave the house, we leave our house, uh, me and my co-defendant. The girls stay behind. We leave our house and we go. We got to get guns first. We pick up guns. His dad was a cop and he didn't lock the guns up. So we go to his house. Because you, you think mom's going to put up a fight? Or is she going to even be there? Well, then this, that's the thing. I could have used a souvenir baseball bat. Yeah. Um, you know, like, I, I'm the first to tell you, uh, I, I'm not a, I didn't go to prison because I'm some hardened criminal that um, was willing to do these crazy things and shoot and stab people. Right. You know what I mean? I armed myself with a gun and committed a home invasion robbery with a mom in the house. Yeah. Um, there's nothing courageous about that, right? Yeah. It, it, everything about that speaks to desperation. But in that moment, the only thing you're thinking about is, I gotta get these pills. I'm going to get these pills. So we go to get guns. My gun literally said Clovis PD on it, etched into this gun. Right. And we, we go to this neighborhood where the, the house is. We park around the corner. We both have hoodies on. And we're walking up to this house and... I asked my co-defendant, how do you want to do this? And he's like, well, let's go around the backyard and we'll bust a window and we'll jump through this window and we'll get in the house that way. And I was like, that's not going to work. And he's like, well, why don't we knock on the door? When she answers, we'll kick the door in and we'll go that way. I was like, bro, this is fucking Clovis. Right. There's a neighbor, there's neighborhood watch signs every corner. Somebody's going to see that happen. Call the police. We're going to prison. And he's like, what do you want to do? I was like, let's go in the backyard first. So we go up and, you know, California has six foot fences that separate all the houses. We open up the backyard fence to the right of us was a door. And I checked to see if the door was open. It was. This is actually, I tell this. This, this is a really nice neighborhood. Yeah, this is a story. This is a story I tell um, to high school students. I usually will detail this out. Um, we go in. We're standing in the garage. I remember seeing like a Pontiac Sunfire type car in there. I turned to my co-defendant. He was like shaking, and I'm like, "What's wrong?" He's like, "I'm nervous, bro." Yeah. And I'm like, "Don't say nothing. Count to three. Follow my lead." So he counts to three. One, two, three, and I like grab this door turn the knob, push it open, and we're in the kitchen. Immediately, the lady's sitting at the kitchen table. And and she's not alert. Like, when she looks at me, it's like, she's high. She's, like, high as a kite. And she, like, looks up at me. And I tell her, get up. Get up right now. I want all the cotton inside this house right now. Get up. I was like, we have all the pharmacy paperwork. We know there's cotton in this house. Take me to it right now. So she gets up from the kitchen table. She makes a right down the hallway. There was family pictures on both sides of the wall in the hallway. We get to the end of the hallway. We make a left. We make a left. We're walking into the master bedroom. When we walk into the master bedroom. I remember looking to the back and there was a dead ball lock closet. I knew that that's where the pills were because that's where she started locking them up when she caught the brothers stealing them right. from her, right? I said, so go open the closet. Open that door right now. So she goes to open it up and she steps back. Several times I tell her, I don't want to hurt you. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to get these pills and I'm out of here as soon as I get them. So she says, they're right here. And they're like on this little cabinet or like a uh, shelf. It's bottles. And I'm like looking at them and there's like nitrates. I'm like, I don't want your nitrates. Like, I want your cottons. So I grabbed these cotton bottles and there was a morphine pill prescription that had like half filled the morphine pills. And I looked at her and I said, where's the liquid? Because she had liquid too. And she's like, I don't have any. I was like, where the fuck is the liquid? I know you have it. And she goes, it's up there. It's like a UPS box, bro. Sealed, brand new, 
with 12 liquid bottles, brand new, it's liquid. So I grab this, I tell my co-defendant, um, get me a pillowcase. He gets me a pillowcase. I put all these pills inside a pillowcase. This idiot dropped the clip out of the gun on the ground. I pick it up, put it in my pocket. He's the, he's just that nervous. It, yeah, he's he just, just nervous, yeah. you know. And and like, look, I'm not a pro fucking criminal either, right. but like, I know not to I, eject I, the yeah, fucking clip. Clip, yeah. Uh, so I go immediately when I leave her room. I go over to her, or, or I leave the closet. I go over to the room and I grab the house phone and I put it in the um, the pillowcase, so I could buy us more time when we leave before she can actually alert nine one one. Because she'd have to actually go to a neighbor or something, which would give us enough time that we would be far enough away from the neighborhood that you wouldn't be able to figure out who was who. Right. And I told my co-defendant, go get the car. I'll be right out. That's when I grab the phone, put it in the pillowcase, and I start walking back through the hallway, go through the kitchen. I'm out in the garage, open up that garage door, go out, open up the wood fence. And as I'm walking down, whoo, my car, car pulls up. It's like perfect. In and out, two minutes. I open up the passenger side door, close the door. We looked at each other, and we were like, you know, high-fiving each other. We drive off, and we jet straight to the country. And we start divvying it up. 440 milligram cottons, 13 liquid bottles, 12 of them brand new, and a morphine pill prescription half filled with morphine pills. What what happened with the, uh, did she, she? She called the police. Yeah. She called the police. But they couldn't. So then it was, the brothers were like, yo, my mom just got robbed. They didn't put it together at all? No. It That's... took them a while. Okay. I was going to say. It took them a while. In fact, the cops had no leads. She couldn't identify anybody. She said, I caught my son, but they were involved when the son caught it. So they asked the son if he knew anything. He's like, I don't know anything about this. And this is how, this is how we get caught. So I knew I was never going to rob somebody ever again. The feeling I got afterwards, I might've been pumped. I was going to get high, but I also knew like, yo, this doesn't work long-term. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I don't want to go to prison for 20, 20 years, right? And this, so this could have gone bad. And I terrified a woman. Who, yeah, absolutely. Was, well, and I wasn't thinking about that for many years. Right. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, at this time, I'm 21 years old. Uh, I'm very self centered. I'm addicted to egotistical. The last thing I'm thinking about is somebody else's feelings. Yeah, yeah. You know, and to where today it's a totally different conversation, right? Like I do what I do today as a living amends. But right. at this time, no. The only thing I could identify with is the feeling of shame and guilt from doing this and knowing it was wrong and what the consequences were for this, especially because this a use a gun and you're done was the thing in California at this time. Three strikes law, 10, 10 20 life when you use a gun is, is a real thing. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm able to think about that. And I say, I'm not robbing anybody else again. What I ended up doing was taking my portion of pills and I sold them right away. I kept a few for myself, but I was on my way to San Diego to get out of town because I had connections down in San Diego when I was living down there for that computer job. And so I'm just going to take this cash that I'm going to hold on to and some pills that I'm going to hold on to. And I'm going to go down to San Diego and I'm going to lay low for a while. Well, when I come home from San Diego, I go back to that house that I was in and uh, my two co-defendants sent me down and they're like, yo bro, um, we got this plan. And I'm like, what plan? They owe one of my friends uh, $1,800. They got to pay him back. And they don't have any money. And they're like, we, we, we're going to you know, do some licks. And I'm like, on who? How old are these guys? We're all 21. You're all 21 years 19, old. 20 and 19, 21. We do some licks. Like, you're not yeah. gangsters. You're no. fucking, you've got a drug problem and you're 19 years old. You yeah. know, like, what do you, what do you? No, right. Yeah. And, uh. I'm like, well, what, what, what is, what are you doing? Well, we need you to be the getaway driver. And I'm like, for what? They're going to call pizza delivery people. <laughs> These are so low brow, bro. I, I, I know. I, I wish I could tell you that I was some white collar <laughs> right. scheme guy that ran no, you know, $20 like million, dollars, but a, no, bro. A bank or something. No, but yeah, no. You this know what's is, so funny? Like you rob a pizza guy with a gun. You're going to prison, yep. you know? But if you walk into a bank with a note that says, give me the money, there won't be any problems, the most you're, you're probably going to get 
between 3500 maybe 10 grand and you're maybe looking at 3 years in a federal prison like I'll take federal over state prison Jesus yeah, for sure you know and you could really get in trouble like if it's a carjacking or if you pull them out of the car oh my god it, it, yeah. and you're in California California oh, and at this no. time oh I don't want to go to California state prison yeah we can talk about that no cuz I've been there and I know all about it it's no good bro no. I don't I've never even been and I I had, I, trust I don't me. hear any good things uh, it, it's probably a lot lighter now but it's what you've heard is probably accurate to the mo to depending on who you've heard it from because there are some cats that are you know very prominent internet figures yeah, that have exaggerated exaggerated uh, yeah, yeah. some of the stuff but yeah but still <laughs> they're gonna invite or no, they're gonna call order pizzas to model homes that are just finished lights on address light works but nobody's inside and the doors get left open at this time because it's the early 2000s right. in a small community like this you could still leave your doors unlocked you could still leave the keys in your car overnight and nobody's going to get in and leave with your car right so when the pizza person gets there they're going to rob them at gunpoint take the money they have on them steal their car drive it to me as their getaway driver and then dump that car and we're going to leave. And I was like, you're fucking going to prison. This is never going to work. And I was like, and how much are you going to get from a pizza delivery driver? A hundred dollars. If he's made several stops before this one, right? Like you're going to do 18 of these to pay this guy back. Like, have you thought about this? I was like, I'm fucking out of here. You know, after the second one, I think the, even even the local cops would go, I think maybe somebody's robbing pizza people. Maybe we need to call the pizza delivery people. Like, this seems like it might be a thing. That's exactly what happened. Are you serious? Yes. <laughs> nice. They did the first one. All right. Remember, this is a small community where you get pulled over at night just to see what you're doing. So they, they do the first one and... I remember they came back to the house. They were all excited, and they had their me and Ed's pizza. They took the pizza fucking from the dude too. Well, I can't blame them. I love pizza. So yeah, the pizza that was all that was a that was a foregone conclusion. And I'm taking the pizza. Get the pizza. That's like get the get the cannolis. Yeah, <laughs> you ever see it? It's got the Godfather. He shoots the guy, and he goes, "Get the cannolis." Sorry. Yeah, Sorry. don't okay. forget the food. Yeah, and they're all excited. They do another one. And this is when I completely split out. So when they do, I, uh, they come home, they've got the pizza, they're excited, I split out. Well, I end up homeless right after this because people know I committed the robbery now with the home invasion. They started talking, and so people don't want me in their house. Right. They don't want me near them because they know the cops are going to come looking for me. Yeah. So I'm spiraling out of control in that direction. I got no money. I'm not able to sell I'm using way more and I can sell drugs. And I've got this girlfriend who I'm trying to keep high as well. So I've got two drug addictions that I'm trying to figure out how to take care of. They pull a second robbery. The girlfriend's involved in this one. One of my co-defendants, he's still alive. His girlfriend is involved in this one. They're a, a, they dump the getaway car. They're now in his little Toyota pickup. And of course, the cops are like, okay, this pizza style robbery is a robbery that will happen again. We're going to start building up a, per a perimeter of uh, officers that are working, waiting for a call for another one of these robberies to possibly happen. Well, they happen. Mm -hmm. And there's a random truck driving at 10, 1030 at night, which is in this town, nobody's out. They pull them over. Nothing on them says that they did the robbery cop shines his light to the back of the truck and says what's that pill bottle oh i thought you're gonna say is that a pizza is that a pizza no <laughs> is that a pizza no, box the other guy has that oh, okay the Sorry. other the other the other uh co-defendant <laughs> has that right like I was, i'm still like okay shines a light what's the pill bottle All right hands it to him guess whose name's on it oh shit the, i mean obviously the original woman that you yes. guys robbed yeah like they didn't dump the fucking nope. Get out of the car. And it's a small, small town. They small know about town. the robbery. Yep. And they're a light bulb. And I know now. They know now. No, they now know that this kid also 
just committed the robbery that was called in. They just don't have the missing component to where's the stuff that you stole and who else is involved. Right. But the pill bottle gets them out of the car, puts them in the back of the cop car, and they're able to take them in. Right. They take them in. Well, the girlfriend says, that's him. Yeah. He did it. They let her go. And then they need more information. So what do they do? They go rearrest her. We need more information. You All know right. more. Right. Okay, yeah, here's here's some more stuff. Next thing you know, the other co-defendant gets arrested. During this time, it's like Christmas of 2004. 2004, correct. And I'm, I'm sleeping on the street, my first three nights on the street. I got a shopping cart with like a $5,000 computer, my Michael Jordan shoes in it. I'm not ready to give these up yet. This is swear to God, honest truth. My mom will come in here and tell you the same thing. <laughs> I have not seen my parents in three years at this time. I go to a Johnny Quick gas station, which is a sh uh, my buddy's dad owns this thing called Johnny Quick, which he attaches to Chevrons. Um, it's like a racetrack or whatever, but right. his, their name is Johnny Quick. I walk to this Johnny Quick. I'm pushing the shopping cart. I'm coming down big time. It's the middle of the winter, but I'm sweating bullets like it's 110 outside. And I walk up to these guys originally because I'm going to call my mom and I say, you got any change? I'm going to make a phone call. And they're like, no, we don't got any change. Well, these kids pull up in this truck and they're like, hey, bro, will you buy some alcohol um, inside? And I'm like, yeah, I'll do that to you. To give you an idea how bad a condition that I was in, those same kids came back in while I was in there lo looking for the alcohol. And they're like, hey, bro, just keep the money. Mm. Don't worry about it. Get food and stuff that you need. Like, and I didn't ask them for anything. They were like, this dude's bad. Just let him keep the money. Right. So I walk out, and then the guys that said they didn't have any change say, well, I, here's some change. Well, they didn't know I also got some money from inside. So I get on the payphone, and I call my mom and uh, my parents' house, and my mom answers. And I said, Mom? And she says, Anthony? And I'm like, I need help. And she's like, where are you? And I'm like, I'm at Cedar and Knees at the Johnny Quick. And I was like, can you please pick me up? And she's like, yeah, I'll be right there. So you got to wait 20 minutes because it's outside of the edge of Clovis, almost Fresno County now. And my mom pulls up and I'll never forget the look on her face, man. Cause she like sees the shopping cart and I'm like rail thin, you know, I got no weight on me. I'm clearly look like I have the flu cause I'm coming down from opioids. Right. And I've got a safe in this shopping cart as well. We load the safe up, we load the computer up, my shoes that I had and we go home and I'm sitting down on this brick fireplace. My parents replaced the wood fireplace with one of those pellet stoves. You load the little wood chips into the top and then it dumps into the thing and the flame goes and then it blows the hot air. I'm sitting right next to this thing, which is right across from my dad's lazy boy chair. And I remember telling him, I'm in trouble. And my dad says, what do you mean? And I said, um, the cops are investigating all my friends right now. Um, I committed an armed robbery and they're going to be looking for me soon. I know it. And my dad was like, well, what did you bring here? Did you, anything from that robbery? Did you bring any of that stuff here? And I'm, I'm like, yeah. And he was like, well, what? And I'm like, that's safe. Anybody that could give some type of police statement could say that pills were hidden inside this safe. And he's like, well, we got to get rid of it. Um, and, and I, that's a tough situation, right? Um, you could say, oh, my dad's a piece of shit. Um, but at the same time, my dad's a father to a son he doesn't want to lose um, going to no, prison. And No, I think that he, I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a, I, I, don't, I don't think I would say I would make a judgment call either way. Like to me, having been to prison and knowing what's, what the ramifications are and that it's all coming down, like to me, I wouldn't have, I, I, I probably would have been like, look, you got to, you got, I'm sorry, but you, you have to leave. The safe has to go, or you have to, you have to take care of that because I can't be involved. But I think night, but that's because of prison experience. I think 90% of fathers would say, I got to get rid of the safe. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's what, but me being in prison. Yeah. And that was a hard thing for me when I was writing my book because my editor was like, we have to tell this story. And I'm like, I, I really don't want to bring that type of judgment to my father because he's a good man. Um, well, I think best he, example of a man that I've ever been given, you know, but at the same time, well, it's, you know, it's, at, your, it's you, it's, yeah. your, it's your son. Yeah. And, 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 and my dad, 
you know, as much as he get out of here, we don't do that. I'm not going to be a part of this. There, there was this component of my father where he stepped in and he, he, he did what I would hope any father would do is try and protect their family. Right. He got rid of the safe. And um, I ended up getting a job for a flooring company during this time. I went and saw um, what they would call as a mat doctor now, medication-assisted treatment, which is Suboxone Clinic. Right. They would also call a fucking um, methadone clinic mat. Right. right? Suboxone was the softer version of what methadone is to right. help people not withdraw and wean off of these opioids uh, because that's what I needed to do. And so they got me into this doctor, and then I started feeling better, and I went and got this job at a flooring company. And, you know, every day me and my dad would take me to work and he'd be like, well, what are you going to tell the cops? You're just waiting for him to come. You, yeah. you know, they're coming. Yeah. Well, f first of all, you, you know, all, all your buddies, like, uh, sorry, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but no, you're fine. Um, I was going to say that that book I read, like I remember at one point his buddies had uh, some other guys had been arrested. And I was like, well, were you concerned they were going to say something? And he goes, he said there, he said, he goes, let me tell you what happens. He said, you're addicted to. To, you're addicted to he said even if you were to try and be strong say i'm not going to tell you anything he goes they'll just wait two hours he's two hours later you're throwing up in a in a in a garbage pan or sorry you're throwing up, up in a um you know a garbage barrel yep. in the interrogation room and they walk in and they'll give you a soda if you'll just tell them something he goes you're ready to tell them anything yeah you're coming down you're 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 going through withdrawals you've never been in so much pain you're you need sugar you need something he's like and he's like you'll tell him anything and because he was in the same thing he's like look when i came down he's like i'm ready to do anything that's exactly anything. right he's like even if you think well i would never well bro then you don't have a clue wait yeah, you wait don't. three hours you may not be able to because you're balled up into a, a corner crying yeah. you know i i, I t when i first got the jail I, I was so anxious because i was feeling all my emotions and and, and body again mm -hmm. but i was so exhausted as i couldn't sit still but if i tried to get off my bunk and take 15 steps to the payphone or the phone it was like running 20 miles right. it's the weirdest thing ever dude like you're so exhausted and tired but at the same time you feel like your internals are crawling outside of itself and running at a million miles an hour so i get this job and I st got one friend who's communicating back to me what's going on. Right. And he's telling me it's getting closer. It's getting closer. They're calling this dude in. They're calling this dude in. They're getting statements from everybody that's close to us. Uh, February 4th at 11 a.m. I'm just getting up. I'm fucking butt ass naked. I'm about to get in the shower. And I hear the doorbell. <laughs> just somebody just like ringing it over and over and over and i hear this thud and i'm like what the fuck and i'm thinking it's my buddy coming over and he's just being an idiot pushing the doorbell right so i i walk down out of the bathroom and i walk down this hallway we've got these like little arches um through our hallway and then it opens up into the master bedroom or the the family room and off the family room are, are the two big sliders that take you into the backyard and as I'm walking out, I look through the corner of my eyes and there's four cops in my backyard. And I'm like, oh shit. So I go up to the front door and we have a screen that you can't see through. And they say, is Anthony Hoffman here? We have a warrant for his arrest. And I open up the screen door and uh, I'm like, yeah. And they're like, where's he at? I look nothing like my, my photo like i looked like a 10 year old in my my driver's license right so they didn't even recognize me from this and i'm like i'm anthony and they're like uh step outside all the way and, and put your hands behind your back this time i've only got underwear on all right so they've got to take me back in the house and i've got to put clothes on they had cops lined up and down the street there was like 15 squad cars and right. i was like did you guys really need 15 squad cars and they're like do you know what you're wanted for <laughs> All right. Like we don't know what you're gonna do. Yeah. If you're gonna shoot out with us or do whatever, we consider you somebody that's armed and dangerous. You've a, a weapon in f your your crime. Yeah. I mean, even the term it, home invasion sounds horrible. Yeah. Right. So they they uh, they take me to, to they, they interrogate me um, about a guy that looked like Patrick Swayze, and uh, I'm like handcuffed <laughs> to the chair. Right. And uh, I was like, man, when are you gonna let me go home? And he was like. Mr. Hoffman, why do you think you're handcuffed to this chair right now? 
And I was like, I don't know, but you don't have anything on me. And he's like, I've got Bob next door. What do you think he's saying about you? And I was like, I don't give a fuck what Bob says about me. That dude's a snake in the grass. And I was like, and he was like, and I've got your fingerprints on a pill bottle. And he puts it right here. And I was like, I can guarantee you right now, my fingerprints aren't on that pill bottle. They weren't. Right. They had nothing on me. The only thing they had were these uh, hearsay statements that said that I was involved in this robbery. My parents, this is the one thing my dad will tell you he ever did for me. He will never do anything again until he dies. And that's the last dollar I'll ever get from him. He, he spent this money on this guy, Michael Eddyart, who at the time was the best defense attorney in, in uh, Fresno, one of the best defense attorneys in the state of California. So I go to court with this big wig attorney and he says, I'm not here to be your friend. I don't care about you. I just need to know what happened, if you did it, how you did it, so we can figure out if we can get you off of this or not. And so I tell him the story. And he says, if your girlfriend tells or your co-defendant rolls, this is over. If we don't get statements from them, this is easy. We're walking out of here. They're not even going to be able to get you on anything because she can't identify you in a photo op. And she was the one that got robbed. Everybody else's statements can't pin you actually inside that house. So I spent five months in, in jail. And then my co-defendant turned state's evidence because he had three strikes against him for the three <sighs> robberies. And they said, so he could uh, get life. if we, you turn state's evidence and you become a victim of this crime and you tell us what Tony did inside that house, we'll drop a strike and uh, we'll let you out of here. And he, all of us, none of us did prison time right out the gate. This is crazy. I never told on anybody. And a lot of people that have been to prison hear my story and they're like, you told them. I'm like, nah, you don't understand. You have to understand. I went in with white skin mm -hmm. with one of the best defense attorneys in the state of California, best defense attorney in Fresno County. My parents spent a ton of money. This guy's reputation is what got me the deal that I got, which was five years felony probation, a strike on my record and 90 days in a treatment center. He told me, I'm going to move you out of the courtroom that we're in right now because this judge is a no-go. And he goes, I'm going to put you in my best friend's courtroom. We play golf with each other every single week. Jesus. And they knew, they knew nothing about it at this time. I remember the judge saying, what? Right. To the DA. Because they had no idea. Do you think that time. worked for you or yes, against you? Yes, it worked for me because somebody I'm friends with now came in behind me and his family's attorney tried to use my case as special circumstances. Like, hey, you can't sentence this guy this and then give my son five years in prison. And uh, they denied the special circumstance uh, sentencing based on how I was sentenced because they recalibrated how they would sentence crimes. He was robbing people at ATM machines. As soon as they would go get the, uh, the money, he would hand, rob them at gunpoint um, at the ATM machines. Another guy that I went to high school with robbed seven CBS pharmacies. He was a pharmacy technician. All right. Got hooked on biking, and then next thing you knew, he knew how to jump over the CVS counter and go straight to the These People like him is why they started putting him in safes and had signs on the windows that said, cotton is locked up or we don't have any. Stay out of here. Because so many people started doing these types of robberies just to get these damn pills. So I get out and I don't change. About 60 days after I get out, the magic team raids my apartment, which is the multi-agency gang consortium. It's like a mini task force, it's mini SWAT team, but it's like Fresno County and then all the little cities pull like their best cops for this gang and drug task force. They raid my house and Wait a minute, so you're still you're so you're selling pills still? Yeah, I get out and sixty days later I end up getting some pills. Okay. And uh, this guy I get pills from, he's like, Why don't I front you eight of these pills? Right. And I'm like, All right, I don't want to do this, but fuck it. And then I can get them for free. So I start selling these pills. I go to re up on my second one. As I'm leaving my apartment, there's a magic car at the front office, and I tell my the guy in my car. I was like, that magic car is in here for me. And I was like, you got anything on you? He's like, I got a half a pill. I was like, take it right now. He's like, why, dude? I was like, that, that, that's for me, bro. I promise you, there's no gangs in here. And uh, as soon as we drive by him, a dude runs out of the office, a cop, jumps in that car, gets behind us. I was like, bro, take that fucking half pill right now. And then right up the street, dude, 
10, 12, 13 cops blowing up the street. They were just getting ready to come and raid my apartment as I was leaving. Right. Little did they know I was out and I was going to pick up. If they would have waited two hours, they would have got me with everything that they wanted. So when they pulled me over, they pull me out of the car. They're pulling all the vents out, lifting up all the mats, trying to find the dope. And the guy's like, we're going back to your apartment and we're going to find exactly what I know we're going to find. And I'm thinking, no, you're not. All right. Let's did your, go. Did your buddy take the pill? Yeah, he took okay. the pill. And he had a little grinder, but you can't do anything with a grinder. So they take me back and they don't find nothing. And then over the course of that moment where they don't get anything, and if you know anything about the cops, if they raid your house and don't get anything, the chances of them coming back right away are very slim. You have to be like big time for them to spend the money and resources and have a warrant signed off where they can come in and even do that. So when they left, I was in the clear for yeah. years. And that was when um, I got introduced um, to the west side of Fresno. Somebody knew somebody on the west side of Fresno in the projects, and uh, I had cash that could get me in over there with some folks. And uh, that was when things started to really like get out of control in terms of like how many pills we were seeing and what was actually happening because what was happening over there on the west side was they knew where the doctor was and they were creating a team of people that would go in and get these prescriptions and then everybody was putting their pills inside this big pile and then distribute them to the white kids that were in Clovis to make profits and so everybody came together with this organization of basically Pro buying out a doctor yeah, like professional pro these are professional doctor shoppers yeah well, they're not, shopping, and not even shopping but yeah, they're yeah. going to the one and then you work through the one guy who is the one guy the doctor trusts and then the team knows what to say when they come in so the doctor knows that you're a part of the team there's cash incentives for you to make sure that this team's getting their prescriptions and everybody's working together to take all of these pills, put them in a big pile, split them up. Everybody gets portions of the profits, but the main guy is getting the most. And then the pills go back into the white communities. And it's not a blacks trying to destroy white communities. This is just how it worked. Yeah, yeah. And uh, of course, I wasn't able to stay up because I'm, I'm a, a drug addicted person. Right. It, it goes downhill to the point that um, I started to lose my connection over there because they couldn't trust me. Right. And uh, I finally get arrested on January 22nd, 2007, after being homeless for six months. So you weren't living at home at your parents' no, house? Uh -uh. They were like, no, they were, rocks. yeah. After my apartment got raided, they didn't talk to me again after that. So it was almost two and a half years that I didn't talk to them. And uh, they violated my probation. They found me in a house that was uh, up for rent, that was empty. Um, a person came in to show it to somebody and I was laying down on the floor with my needles next to me and they thought I had overdosed and died. So they called the paramedics. That was on January 22nd, 2007. And uh, 30 days later, you know, because it was a violation probation, it was pretty cut and dry. I'm on my way to prison. Uh, I've got a four and a half year term. And uh, that was, you know, I started in cell living. So when I got to California prison, I got to see what California prison was all about. So it's a pretty cut and dry thing. I, in 30 days, they violate my probation and, and I'm on a bus to the California penitentiary. I started in a level four yard, which was cell living. So I was on lockdown for 23 and a half hours a day. I'm grateful that I got to experience that first um, because I told you when I, uh, before we started, I actually met a couple solid guys um, before I hit the mainline prison. So this was just reception the first 90 days. And I'll never forget this, you know, and anybody that tells you they're not scared when they're going to prison for the first time, they're fucking liars. All right. I don't care if you're a bulldog gang member, a blood, a crip, a Nazi lowrider or a skinhead. It, you're scared the first time because you don't know what's going to happen. You're in a paper jumpsuit. I'm in a paper jumpsuit. My arms are shackled. My ankles are shackled. And I'm sitting on a bus for three hours going to this location. When I get off the bus, the first thing I hear is that the whites and bulldogs are at war with each other. I don't know if you heard any of that when you went to the Fed pen. <laughs> no, the first day I was there, though, somebody did get stabbed and they screamed lockdown that somebody got stabbed in the rec yard. And I thought, this, is, this isn't this is good. I'm not prepared for this. Yeah, and I think that we probably all have some type <laughs> right. of moment where you realize uh, what my cellmate, Ry Ry from Ventura County said, you know, this place is fun sometimes, but it's still prison. Right. And that means we never know what's going to happen. And so I'm like, what does that mean? The whites and the bulldogs are at war with each other. In Fresno, we have the bulldog gang members. It's a Hispanic gang that doesn't claim to be Northern Hispanic or Southern Hispanic. They claim to be bulldogs and they're not run by a shot caller. They just do whatever they want. 
so I get educated on what war means. What war means is if I cross a bulldog or I see a bulldog, I have to try and kill that guy. If I don't try and kill that guy, my people will kill me for not taking off on him because that's the way the politics and the rules are currently for this. And this is, this is some type of vengeance for some type of white and bulldog happening that happened at some point when they were on the yard together, something happened, a white and bulldog went after each other. Then the two cars, the two groups said, okay, we're at war. Now, anytime one of our guys see each other, we have to, we're going to try and kill you. And, uh, you know, they, we went through the whole strip down thing. It takes hours. I get to my cell at about 1030 at night. And I remember walking into the cell block and all you could hear was bulldogs barking and they were on the lower tier. Cause if you put a bulldog in the upper tier, they would clog the toilets and they would flood the tier. Like they were really interesting people when it came to prison. Like they were not there to do time. They were there to disrupt everybody and anything that they could. Cause that's what they like to do. Right. But they also, their call is a bark. And some of these guys barks sound like real ass dogs. So you walk into this cell block and you're listening to row, 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 right. row. <clears throat> and then you're hearing, you know, blood swooping out the door and a Crips got their call. The only ones that aren't doing anything are the Southern Hispanics and the whites that are up on top. And they say, uh, I got cell 254, top bunk. And I remember looking up, seeing my cellmate as I go up the staircase. And as I get closer, he's got big white power on his stomach. And on the back of his head, he's got a big swastika. They call him Dizzy from Antelope Valley. He's an Antelope Valley skinhead. And I'll never forget this. I shut the door behind me. He pulls out his, uh, a piece and uh, he says, there's a, no hands uh, there's a no hands policy on this yard, youngster. If you got a problem with me, you have to stab me with this piece. If I got a problem with you, I'm going to stab you with this piece. He goes, you can turn around and lock it up right now. Just bang on that door and tell that cop you went out here and you want to go PC. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. But what a no hands policy meant was you can't fight with your hands. If a problem exists with this person, it has to be a problem to the degree that you're willing to stab him over it. If you fought somebody with your hands, you'd get served the punishment for breaking the rules. That night, though, I sit down on my bunk and I read this quote that says, be careful what you think because your thoughts become your words. Be careful what you say because your words become your actions. Be careful what you do because your actions become your habits. Be careful what you make a habit because your habits become your character. And your character becomes your destiny. And I just kept reading it. And it made so much sense to me. And at that time, I wanted a different life for myself. But I'm in this environment where you don't get a different environment. You're here. And so I started thinking about what that meant for me. And really what it meant for me was that my perspective on life at that point had been completely miscalibrated. That most of the problems that I had in my life, and the reason I even reached out for was my perception of things, my perception of self and my safety, my perception of anxiety, what that meant, my perception of friends, my perception of cops, teachers, everybody was miscalibrated. I always put myself in a position of lacking power. And so I started to realize that, you know, maybe I have an opportunity right now to start changing my life while I'm in here and, and be prepared to get out. Because when I went to rehab after I was sentenced for the armed robbery, I wasn't paying attention to rehab. I'll never use again. I'm good. I don't want to go to prison. That's it. All right. Not realizing that's not the way it works. So while I'm here, though, in this cell block, I'm introduced to these things that are just completely blowing my mind with how prison actually is. My neighbors were skinheads and they were porters, but they would try to not lock the cell door. Because if they could keep the cell door open, they could get a they could get a bulldog that's going to med call, or a bulldog that gets to leave the cell to go somewhere. Sure shit, one day, dude. They didn't close the the cell door, and the cop in the tower didn't notice that their cell wasn't closed. And if he did, then he was in on it. Right. And um, a bulldog comes out to go to med, and uh, this dude Tr goes down there, squares up with him, and starts fighting this dude. And uh, they're spraying them with the pepper spray. And I'm sure you've been around that pepper spray. It's not like the shit that you buy at Dick's Sporting Goods. That mm -hmm. pepper spray is like so strong. It was choking us in our cell. And mm -hmm. we were 50 feet away from it. Still don't stop. Cop in the tower. Get down. Get down. Get down. Still don't stop. Get down. Get down. Get down. Still don't stop. Bow. 
shoots the gun, hits the dude, boom, fight stops. And like everybody's on their cell windows. Is it like a beanbag gun? Bean, uh, okay. So block gun. Okay. We use block guns in California. I think they have beanbags, but only for the right for right groups. But the f- gun of choice is a block gun. It's basically a, a cork, a oval cork with a, a racket ball, half a racket ball on the tip. Okay. But when that thing has yeah, velocity yeah. on it, you should see the bruises it leaves. Right. That stops the fight. Ray Ray turns around and he looks at me and he goes, I told you, bro. You can have fun here. He goes, but this, you never know when this is going to happen. And he was like, and he's like, and I hope you understand you cannot stop until you get shot or they get shot. He was like, if you stop at the pepper spray or you stop at them telling you to stop, that person's going to kill you, bro. And I just remember thinking to myself, what the fuck am I doing here? Right. (laughs) You know, Um, I get transferred to the main line, but now I go low level. I'm level two. I'm in a dorm. And uh, the politics are looking totally different. Um, and I, I, I was cooking wine to start. Um, Rai Rai taught me how to make wine. We were getting drunk once a week. My right. parents weren't helping me. And I'm thinking, you know, he's like, you got to sell wine to make money. That's how you're going to feed yourself because the state isn't going to feed you enough. So I get caught making the wine. And I think to myself, you know what? M- my friends aren't in here my friends on the street didn't have my back. I'm telling my parents that I'm going to change. And they're finally answering my phone, phone calls. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Right. And I took this process of learning how to brush my teeth, make my bed and organize my stuff every single day. If you follow me on uh, Instagram, I post my bed wherever I'm at in the country. It's the first thing I do. My bed is made, I brush my teeth, and my room is organized. And that was something that I learned in prison, and you probably learned it yeah, yourself. You Your personal Bro, space. We, my wife and I, every, I mean, every single morning, the bed is made, every single uh, morning, like, we wake up. We wake up at, like, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, because that's when they turn the lights on. Yeah. You know, that's when the guards turn the lights on, and then yeah. you... We go work out in the morning. We we very much have a, a routine, and it's because it's because of prison. Never yeah. did that shit before. No, Never. No, no. And it's been five years. I'm yeah. still doing it. Yeah. I, I, there but it was. But it's right. It, it 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 helps you organize your thoughts and your day, and it, it's a great measure of how your day will go. If the, you know, I, it might seem stupid, but no, you know, it's not you stupid, know, right, bro? If you listen to me. And my philosophy on life now, so much of it was built behind what prison was teaching me without right. saying, learn this. Yeah. Stru- right. Discipline, structure, routine, being okay with little, not needing much. Right. Sitting with myself in a way that I couldn't, I can't leave, I can't hide, I can't do things. Sure, I could have used dope because I've seen more people come into prison, alcoholics and meth addicts, and leave heroin addicts than anything else. Right. Like there's more dope in California prisons than there is on the street. Fortunately for myself, I had made that decision that I'm done. This is my opportunity to get this right. Cause if I don't, I'm going to die on the street and that's just not going to be my story, you know? And so, um, after the wine charge, I start tightening the bolts on my life, you know, figuring out and, you know, really reflect, reflecting on myself and what I was doing wrong and what I was doing right. And I think that there were great qualities about my drug dealing uh, desires, right, is to serve other people. But the the instinct and in how I was doing it was what was miscalibrated. So it's like, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, like I need to create things that help other people. And by giving in a way um, that I've been gifted, then I'll feel I'll, I'll fill these voids that I've had in my life. And so I started really to reflect on like what my needs were and what I was doing and then disciplining myself and like, you know, being able to abstain from what everybody else was doing um, for me wasn't so much of a challenge because I was so beat into the ground when I went in. Had I gone in at 21 when I committed the robbery, I would have left a wreck. Mm-hmm. I would have got involved in the gangs. I would have tried to be that guy for the older guys and uh, really just got r- run through in terms of being taken advantage of and taking my stuff and getting me to go do work on the yard that I didn't want to do, but I wanted people to think that I was about the business and stuff like that. Yeah, you um, go in four years, you fucking, you leave 15, 20 years later because you've stabbed three guys. Or oh, yeah. You know. And you've seen that. Yeah. You did enough time that you, you, there was a guy from Bakersfield. I mean, he was stacking on four years. And I'm like, dude. You only go home, right? 
you know, these people that you don't even know, yeah, you're, you're trying don't, to impress they don't them. Care about they, you. they don't care about you right. either. You know? Your friends in the street didn't care about you. These guys don't care about you either. Yeah. Even though I'm, like I said, like some of my closest relationships with guys now are all guys I met in prison. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. there's, good, there's good guys there. Oh, no, yeah. You, you know? can meet the good ones there. They're very but, few. Yeah, they're very few. You I met be, two. Yeah. In two years, I met two. You know, you did 13 years. You got enough time to probably meet 10 maybe. Right. That, uh, and but, some are still in there and some aren't. Yeah, and that's okay because the ones that are in there that are good people are, you know, f- calculating all of their mistakes and righting their wrongs with what they do in there today. Right. You know, and one of my greatest mentors, Toby Wade, who was actually a black guy, I wasn't supposed to talk to in prison, served 21 years for murder, and he's out now. Um, but everything he was doing while he was in there and then helping me and not asking for anything in return um, was to, 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 to make an amends, right? Like he didn't want to get out and make an apology to her. His apology to her was how he was going to change himself inside and then the work that he was going to do when he got out to be a family man, a father to his kids, a husband to his wife, a taxpayer to the government, if you want to consider that a, a, a good thing. Um, right. All of the things that he does today that keeps him out of prison. And that, that was really what, what I was aiming to do. But I started it with just brushing my teeth, making my bed, organizing my stuff, learning how to do all of the things I knew I could control. Because I had learned in 23 years of my life at this point that there are many things that are going to happen in our lives that are out of control. And so, I mean, there was situations that I would see things in there that, um, you know, would falter as you're going in there. Because, you know, you, you said you saw somebody get stabbed. I remember one time I'd work out in the yard and there was a dude just sitting there like three laps. I'm, and I'm walking the yard just in a puddle of blood laying there. And I'm like, fuck, dude. Nobody's going to say nothing. Right. You can't say nothing. So you're just waiting for him to close the yard. Yeah, like who, you're waiting for a cop to finally see it, hit the alarm, and then everybody close the yard and go in, you know, and I've and, and the fights, you know, it's, it's no holes barred. Whatever goes, goes. I remember I watched a, a, a Southern Hispanic gang member and a black dude fight, and uh, the black dude was a two-striker. And he took a lock off of one of the uh, lockers and he just like turns around, gets up, side arms it. And I'm like on my bed watching this fight and I watch, he's throwing it towards me and it just boom right on this dude's forehead and just blood. And I remember thinking, I was like, oh my God, that was so sick. He couldn't do that again if he tried a million times. Like that was like right in a pipe to his forehead. It struck him out doing life in prison life now. in prison for throwing off for throwing a lock out. although like the the bloodiest fight i saw what wouldn't consider a fight attack was a guy with a lock that hit a guy four or five times in the back of the head with and, a sock or just the lock no in no his he, hand? no no he had a you know the belt he had a belt oh. wrapped around his arm looped through the lock so it's the lock is here yeah so and i mean just walked up the high and, rock, 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 and the yeah. blood was everywhere yeah and i remember first thing i thought of was because there was so much blood was did, what did i get blood on me yep um anyway he fell down guys tried to stand up again bra, bra, bra. but your scalp blades so much you know like I, yeah. I just remember thinking that you know it certainly wasn't a fight it was just an attack like i had no idea yeah and it was over something that really needed to be taken care of it was over a punk Oh yeah, that seems so legit. That the, seems the one legit. I watched was over a bag of chips. Yeah, of course. So that's that's reasonable. <laughs> of course, can't believe you waited so long for a bag of chips. Yeah, seems legit. Um, and you know what? That was that was prison life. Uh, and by that time, you know, um, I was a model inmate. And, and I tell people, uh, you know what? I, I, the war stories is cool and as entertaining as they can be. When you get to prison, I, there's a lot of motherfuckers that can do what everybody else is doing. That's the easy thing to do. I only saw a few people the entire time that I was there on the same wavelength that I was on. Like, I'm going to get out, stay out, and I'm going to do something with my life, right? It was, what what can we do today to make a difference for tomorrow? And um, something inside of me, the spiritual experience I had and something inside of me, just I, I wanted something different for myself. And I wanted to get out and see what I could do with that. You know, I came from a great family, raised in a good neighborhood, went to a really good school. Like I have everything at my disposal. Then to throw that away would be what? You know, there's people that dream to grow up in a neighborhood like I do, have a family like I do, have some people don't want to be the color of their skin and think of how easy I got it because the color of skin that I got. Like, and here I'm going to throw it away and end up in prison. 
right. and spend my life here uh, hooked on and shoot dope until I die? Because that was what was going to happen. I was going to die in a hotel by myself or be found on the street, you know, and I would just be another, one, another statistic, a person that wasted their talent. But I got out and I, and I started racing BMX professionally. Um, my parole agent thought it was all bullshit. Told my mom he was going to rearrest me in 30 days. <laughs> Why? He now, didn't think. He said, What are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to, I've been training for the Olympics. And I was like, <laughs> That already sounds, yeah, oh, already yeah, thought, yeah. Oh, Jesus. A dreamer. Another yeah. dreamer. You're, you, you, you had a better chance if you'd said, I'm going to be a rap star. Oh, yeah. How many times I hear it? Oh, I yeah, hear dude. Well, a- so here's what I tell people <laughs> in a California prison, if you're black, you're a rapper. Yeah. If you're white, you're an MMA fighter. And if you're Mexican, you're connected to the cartel. Yeah. I've heard every story. Yeah. And they're always that. I'm a rapper. I'm a fighter. And I'm connected to the cartel in this. It's like, dude, get out of here. You're none of those. Right. You're a person addicted to or you're a criminal and you're in prison just like me. He says, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to race my bike professionally. I brought on the magazine. I was like, look, I've been on the cover of a magazine. Like, I can ride a bike. I was like, but I've been training for the Olympics since I've been in prison. And I really had. And, uh, and I was like, I'd like to start a nonprofit for kids at some point. And I, and I'm really want to tell my story as a speaker. And he like looked at me and he was like, who brought you here? <laughs> he must've thought you were just insane. Oh yeah. He's, I said, my mom. And he's like, go get her. And I'm like, you want me to bring my mom in here? Right. And he's like, yeah. So I go out to the parking lot of the parole office and I don't know how the fed parole office is, but state parole office is like a zoo. There's so many people out there pissing and showing up for parole. And so I go out and I tell my mom, she's got to come in. My mom's absolutely embarrassed. Like she should be and would be right. And this guy says, you know what your son's telling me he's going to do. And she's like, you you talking about riding the bike. And she's like, he's like, he's your son says he's going to the Olympics. He's training for the Olympics. And he wants to start a nonprofit for kids and he's going to be a speaker. And my mom, that's right. He's been working on this since he was in prison. Looks her dead in the eye and says, your son's full of shit, ma'am. And he goes, I brought you in here so I could tell you to your face. Your son is full of shit and he's going to go back to prison in 30 days and I'm going to rearrest him. And it's going to be you and your husband's fault for being stupid enough to believe this story. And my mom just looked at him, got on his truth. Um, and he's on my mini documentary. He, he's gave me that. I was like, you owe me this. And uh, he said, I told you, yeah, we reenacted that whole thing. And uh, <laughs> that's great. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He says, uh, yeah, I, I, so he's, he's all right. Shit. No, yeah, he turned he's out all right. to be all right. Yeah, yeah. right. Years later, he came yeah. back into my life through a random message on Instagram. And uh, my mom looked at him and she's like, you don't know my son. This kid can ride a bicycle. I was like, and if he says he's going to the Olympics, I promise you he'll be there. And we just walked out. Five months later, I raced my first pro race. Hadn't touched a bike seven years, but I've been training my ass off, riding every day. You know, I was already physically fit when I left prison. You know, there's a lot of people get physically fit. I was getting physically fit to get back on my bike, though. And I took third place. That first year, I won five races in the lower pro division, moved up to the Olympic level. Um, I was on the cover of a magazine when I was 18, and it wasn't on, I wasn't on the cover because I was lucky. Right. I truly could ride a bicycle, and it was sports was my gift. And my dad was a professional motocross racer. Racing's in our family. We just, our brains understand racing. And I had the talent and, and, and the speed to make it work. And I got invited to the Olympic Training Center um, my second year. So I started training down at the Olympic Training Center. And this at this time, I'm like building this speaking thing up, trying to get this speaking thing going. But it's not really a career. It's just, I just want to help people. Right. Like I just want to tell my story and stop kids from making the mistake that I made. And they need to know that that orange bottle is dangerous right i'm not a criminal i'm not this dude that comes in here and i I got a ton of people i want to hurt or have hurt like i was a person who struggled in his early life and he found in an orange bottle what felt like was the answer and that orange bottle was a fucking lie right like i just wanted to stop kids from gravitating towards that because in my town there were task force everybody was going to prison people were starting to die but there was no talk about it like people still weren't talking about it so I end up blowing my knee out my second year of racing, which ends my racing career. And I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do now? There goes my Olympic dream, you know? 
and uh, my speaking started to take off and I started to build up some momentum. And I thought that my, my knee injury was a great opportunity for me to start my nonprofit and switch gears from racing to coaching. And that's kind of what I did starting around 2012 um, to the point that we were able to build up, uh, you know, about $120,000 a year that we could raise for the nonprofit, which, you know, for a dude with no education and um, just a passion to help people and no connection to the chief of police and all these rich people in town, like it was good. Right. You know, we're giving away $40,000 worth of bikes, $10,000 of skateboards. Do kids would camp out at five o'clock in the morning to, for my summer camp signups because it was free. Right. And you would leave with a $400 bike, a helmet. Like we were really trying to do good work for the community with that. And uh, my coaching was what, you know, became the big thing. And I finally got these athletes to start trusting that I knew what I was doing. Because in the beginning, it's like, dude, you just got out of prison and we're right. homeless. What the fuck do you know about training people? Well, one of my athletes, uh, Brooke Crane, a little blonde girl, 2012, asked me to be her coach. And she was one of the best riders in the world for females. Um, she made the Olympic team in 2016. Um, and that was really what dubbed my story from prison to the Olympics was I became the first person that started in a prison cell to participate in the Olympics at any level. Obviously, I wanted to go as an athlete, but I made it as a as a coach. And did the media pick that up? Was that like a, a no, thing? it wasn't. It oh, okay. wasn't. And it's and it mainly because this is and this all royal rolls back to um, BMX is such a niche sport. And highlighting things is really about the highlighting of, of the athletes. And even the BMX athletes aren't getting any type of work. At this time, they were playing it late at night. The, the recognition that I got was actually from the United States Olympic Committee, which to me was one of the coolest. We went to a dinner in, in Rio, and there was a bunch of people there with me, Brooke, and her family that were from the Olympic Committee. And you know, Brooke and her family really pumped me up a lot. They, I didn't like to talk in that uh, environment about my stuff, you know, but they would bring it up and talk about how proud of they were. They were. And well, after the Olympics, um, a guy named Dave reached out to me on Instagram and said, I had no idea about your story. Um, send me your address on behalf of the United States Olympic Committee. I'd like to send you something. And so I've got this letter from the United States Olympic Committee. They gave me a special coin that only um, a handful of coaches that were selected um, got to have this commemorative coin from the Rio Olympics. Um, and basically thanking for me for my service to Brooke Crane and the Olympic team and, and, and the United States and trying to help the, the advancement of their uh, placements in, in the Olympics and then the coin that um, I now get to hold on to. Um, outside of that, though, at that time, um, there, there was no media attention around like kind of what I was doing and what my story was all about. And I was OK with that. You know, it's about Brooke, not me. Right. I'm just there to help her and do what I can. And she's like a little sister to me now. But since then, um, my my speaking career is, you know, catapulted to where I'm on the road 200, 250 days a year. And I'm speaking to governments, high schools, middle schools, colleges, healthcare organizations, you name it, about mental health and addiction. Um, and then I started my own treatment center, PH Wellness, two years ago. We're in Southern California. That's okay. what the PH okay. is for. I was wondering. Um, and that's Matt Paws, Tony Hoffman, but it's a play on words. PH, uh, PH Wellness, our slogan is find your balance. Uh, and we, we really have created something unique in that um, <clears throat> we only use master's level clinicians. And we have this huge fitness component. My thing has really been the clinical part is when somebody comes to PH Wellness, I want to make sure that these individuals are wrapped around the best of the best. Um, we have uh, one of my guys is a lifer. My program director is a lifer that served over 20 years, but he's been sober and he gets it. My clinical directors have PhDs and master's degrees. So when they sit down with somebody and they have complex childhood traumas and things that have happened to them, that the people that they're working with can actually help them through some of these situations that are the root cause for, for why they're using. But the fitness component is what really makes us unique. We have a 5,000 square foot fitness center. And uh, every, every week, um, clients are engaging with certified fitness instructors and uh, instructors with our actual uh, treat at our actual treatment center. Um, and so being able to engage with a certified trainer and getting people moving and trying to get active. And, you know, when you get to prison, you start finding yourself doing things that you would have never done before because you have all that time to, to get creative and get the body moving and 
kind of spark those endorphins and stuff that can be really beneficial to you, which you probably, like you said, you still make your bed, you still do some of the stuff that was in prison because it became a beneficial part of like your routine to life. Right. And so we've uh, started with 12 beds. We're about to be licensed for 18 beds. And my, my dream really is to scale this thing across the United States and uh, create the McDonald's of treatment. And not that McDonald's quality is high, but you know what you get when you go to McDonald's. Right. Whether it's in Rio de Janeiro or in Beverly Hills, California, McDonald's is McDonald's, yeah. you know? It's the same cheeseburger. Yeah. And so, and I've just been on this journey now where it's, um, you know, we talk like I, I, I don't want to, I don't need to apologize for my past. Right. Do I have some regrets robbing the lady? Yeah. Yeah. For obvious reasons, but my past shaped me to who I am today and I'm okay with that. And what I do today is, is my apology. Um, and nobody can make me feel any different, you know, because I know why I get up and do what I do. Um, and, and I'm always grateful for an opportunity like this because some people want to hear about yeah, yeah. <laughs> all the shit that you went through because they never lived that life. Oh, I can listen. I already, I can already hear the, the, the comments. You ought to go into the comment section when this thing plays because people will be like, such was so inspiring. Oh my God, this guy's story. And they'll go on and on. Like, yeah. they, cause they, it's funny because they do that like, Every once in a while, I'll have a story, and I'll I'll just kind of almost shrug it off, like you know, and then but then again, people constantly tell me that my story is inspiring, this and that, like, and I have no I I have no desire to to be inspiring, like I don't I don't even try, you know, <laughs> but they find it. So if somebody actually has like a real turnaround story where they've really said, hey, you know, I'm going to make a conscious change to to do all this and help other people, yeah, then that's. You know, that's the people love that. Yeah. Why well, it's I and I the way I look at it is there's somebody for everybody. Yeah. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. You know, some people love that your inspiration is not that that was your life purpose and you were going to change that. You know, just you doing what you do is an inspiration because you're not who you used to be. Right. But you don't. Well, I wasn't working go into that. Process, that wasn't working right? for me. Yeah. It, you know, it wasn't working. And I definitely in prison realized like that this is like, I, I just can't do this. Like this is, this is like, I'm better off staying in someone's spare room, working at McDonald's than I am coming back here. Yeah. You know, for sure. I had a, you know, there's a, there's the opposite spectrum of how I talk about addiction and the psychology of it. Right. Is um, there's a guy in Pennsylvania and, and his is great. Cause it works for a lot of people. He's like, no, you didn't use because you were sexually abused. You used because you fucking liked it. Okay. That's it. You got to stop using because you realize that it doesn't work for you anymore. There's no mechanics to that. Some people don't need the mechanics. Right. They just need the surrender to that. This doesn't work for me. I'd rather sleep in a closet and work at McDonald's than come back here. You don't need the rest. Right. It's all the same though. Whether I, actually, I break it down. I was going to say, I actually did sleep in a closet. I always say the spare room, but I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> there was the spare, the spare room was a studio that had a large closet that was just big enough for my bed to fit in and i slept in the college in the in the closet and used the studio to paint so you're this is on the comeback this is yeah this, this is after i went from the halfway house to the spare room and stayed there 18 months and slept in the closet but it's too hard to explain the closet thing but when you actually said the closet thing i thought yeah that's actually i didn't exactly what happened i did sleep in the closet and your willingness is why you're, you're you haven't gone back well my cell didn't have a i was cozy in the closet um yeah no not because, everybody can do that though create no, the parallel and perspective i think the problem that i think the thing is is that i fell so far and and after 13 years realized like you don't need all this shit you know and i got humble mm -hmm. for the first time in my life sorry yeah bro i've been on the fucking verge of tears the whole time you've been talking and i'm kind of a pussy so i cry easy so it's not that big of a deal no you're good um but yeah, like I just got super humble and appreciative mm. of just the everyday things. You know, being in prison, it's like I'm just happy to have. I can turn on YouTube, I can watch it, I can watch Netflix, I can turn the channel without having to put it on a form and ask guys, "Hey, do you guys mind if we watch this on Tuesday?" Fuck you, Cox. We're watching this on Tuesday. All right, yeah. um, you know, so you get appreciative and you realize, like, fuck, I'm better off doing anything than this. Yeah, and I think being appreciative. And like you said, following those basic kind of rules, that simplicity of life is why everything has come fairly easy. Like my wife thinks I work all the time, but just, are you fucking serious? Yeah, no. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, just like you, you're like, I live on an airplane, like walking through the airport 
with your bag, walking up and getting on your Delta flight. Man, the first time I did that, fucking nothing cooler. And I'd only been out of prison like three months because you have to wait three months before they'll let you travel and you have to get a per- permission. I had to do all this shit, jump through these hoops, got on that plane and I thought, fuck, bro, three months ago, you were you were sleeping in a bunk bed. Yeah, Like this is the coolest fucking thing ever. It's totally Fif- worth sleeping. 15 years later. Right. No different to me. Yeah. Going through that so airport. Cool. So cool. Gratitude, bro. My, uh, if, if I can share with you. Yeah. It hit me like a month, 11 to 13. I was hand washing a Dickies white t-shirt because a Dickies white t-shirt was what the ballers had in prison. Right. right. You couldn't put that in the laundry chute. No, it turns it would, gray. It would turn gray or they would steal it. Oh. So I'm washing this thing with my hands, right? And as I'm scrubbing it, I'm thinking to myself. Uh, this white t-shirt is like a million dollars in here. And if I can find value in this white t-shirt, how much more value should I have for my freedom, my ability to watch Netflix, my ability to go through an airport, my ability to get to do all these things that I don't get to today. And from that day forward, I've never found myself out of gratitude for longer than a day. I've just always been able to calibrate back to what matters. The simple life having my life, getting to go home, getting to have a house, being able to buy a meal, being able to not be strung out on, have friends that I know that have my back. If you got a wife, a wife that supports you, even with all the shit that you've been through, you know, always something we can find gratitude for. But until you have that moment, in my opinion, you truly can't fully grasp um, how amazing life really is. Like in all the good shit, even with all the bad that we're hearing about is going on like right in front of us. It just skips over us if we don't know how to be grateful. Right. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching. Do me a favor. If you like the video, hit the subscribe button. Also consider joining my Patreon. Plus, if you look in the description, we're going to put all of his links will be in the description, which include the pH pH wellness. Uh, He's got uh, Instagram. He's got, uh, we're going to have all the social media links and ways for him to get to his uh, website. And please check it out. I appreciate it. See ya.